Are you putting the first slide up? Yes. Excellent. Uh, good morning for Brazil. Good evening for England. Jeff, it's a great pleasure to have you here with us. Uh, thank you very much to accept the invitation. And so, who study copepods probably read, read a paper from Jeff Bokshaw and Ronnie Ruiz, Jeff, <laughs> from London New Zealand. And I think uh, Jeff Bokshaw needs no introduction because the large amount of papers and studies published on copepods. And Jeff is a senior research from the Natural History Museum of London. And he studied especially copepods is a, one of the smart uh, researchers that I need in ever years that I studied copepods. So Jeff, the work is yours. Thank you very much to accept the invitation again. And I will uh, share our screen, I, my screen here. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Well, thank you very much, Gilmar, for that introduction and for inviting me. That's great. I mean, I'm and for arranging all the technology, which hopefully is going to work OK. Um, I've worked on copepods for almost exactly 50 years, because in September 1971, I started my PhD thesis on parasitic copepods on marine flatfish. Um, but when I finished my thesis, I moved to the Natural History Museum and they wanted me to work on plankton. So although it was quite hard to relearn everything, I um, switched from parasites to plankton for a while. And that was just a terrific education in the diversity of copepods. And um, it really helped me broaden my knowledge base. Um, and I kind of fell more in love with copepods as a result. So Gilmar has asked me to give a sort of overview to the global diversity of copepods. And I know you've just finished a course that's primarily focused on freshwater copepods. But I'm going to deal with marine and freshwater during the course of this lecture. Okay, Gilmar, could you start the slides, please? Okay, next. <laughs> so the topics I'm going to cover are, you know, what is a copepod? What do I mean by diversity? How many valid species are there? Which orders are the most species rich? And what are the kind of trends in discovery? Then I'm going to do some comparisons between marine and freshwater copepods um, in terms of their species richness. And then I'm going to look at some other smaller topics like body size in marine calanoids, and then the repeated colonization of freshwater, the repeated transitions into parasitism, and the colonization of groundwaters. And finally, I'm just going to finish with some comments on gaps in knowledge and the importance of molecular data. So I'd better start with what is a copepod. When I was an undergraduate, um, this was the typical copepod that you saw in a textbook. It was a marine planktonic calanoid. And they were regarded as hugely abundant and hugely important in the marine ecosystem. And that's still what most biologists think of as a copepod. Um, can I have the next? The name copepoda comes from the Greek and it means all footed. And it refers to their all footed swimming legs. And you can see at the back end of this calanoid, you can see there are five pairs of swimming legs. You go to the next slide. And the important thing about um, 
the swimming legs is that the members, the left and right legs of each leg pair are fused medially to an intercoxal sclerite or a coupler that's highlighted with the blue arrow. This ensures that the legs always beat together. So it can't turn its body by beating one side or the other side. Both the legs on both sides always beat together. Next slide. And why this is a useful character is because all copepods, even the very bizarre, highly modified um, parasitic copepods, they have at least one stage in their life cycle where they have swimming legs that are joined by a coupler. So it's that rather rare thing. It's a proper diagnostic character because there are lots of other crustaceans that have stages in their life cycle that resemble copepods. But only true copepods have this coupler joining the swimming legs. OK, next slide. So the topic is global diversity, and we're looking really at two different aspects of diversity. The first one, which I'll spend most time on probably, is patterns of species richness. Um, basically, how many valid species there are doing different kinds of things and in different groups. But I also will intersperse that with a look at the diversity in body form, because copepods really are the most amazingly adaptable and kind of evolutionarily plastic crustaceans that I know of. OK, next slide, please. Uh, go back one. I mean, the global diversity, the total number of valid species is 14,737. Now, I've quoted worms as the World Register of Marine Species, but the numbers you see on worms are just the numbers for marine species. So you have to add on the um, freshwater groups to get the full total of valid species. Can I have the next slide? There are four large orders, the calanoids, which dominate the plankton, the cyclopoids, which are a real mixture, the cyclopoida. They uh, have a lot of freshwater forms. Um, they contain planktonic forms, but they also contain quite a lot of parasites. And then we have the harpacticoids, which are predominantly um, benthic, there are some planktonic harpacticoids. Um, there are nearly 5,000 valid species of um, harpacticoids. And then the other large order up at the top is the Siphonostomatoida. These are all parasites, um, mostly on fish, but they occur on a lot of other host groups as well. So I'm just going to have a very brief look at these four large orders. Have the next slide. So the Calanoida, as we've already seen, they dominate the plankton. Um, they're one of the most abundant life forms on the planet because you can find them in the oceans. Uh, from the surface to the depths. Um, so, and they cover, the oceans cover 71% of the planet to an average depth of 3.7 kilometers. So that is the largest inhabitable space or habitat on the planet, and it's full of calanoids. So they are incredibly abundant group. Typically, they have these long antennules that you can see there, which are pigmented nicely in red in this form. Um, and the basic division between the anterior prosome of the body and the posterior urosome comes behind the leg seg the, the segment bearing the fifth legs. So that is the gymnoplean body plan. I have the next slide. Cyclopoids, there were about four and a half thousand species of cyclopoids. They typically have shorter antennules. Um, one characteristic is that they have a very reduced vestigial antennary exopod that's absent in a lot of groups. Um, and they have the other podoplean body plan. So the main articulation in the body 
between the prosome and the urosome is behind the fourth leg bearing segment, not behind the fifth as in calanoids. Next one, please. So these are the, uh, just a selection, random selection of harpacticoids. They're all marine. Now harpacticoids are the dominant copepod group in the epibenthos and, and in benthic copepods in general and in the interstitial forms in the marine environment. Um, so they are quite varied in their body morphology. You can see some of the more unusual examples here. Um, but they and they are currently the most species rich group with getting towards 5000 valid species. Have the next one, please. Next, yeah. And the last of the four big orders are siphonostomatoids. They're all parasitic. Um, and they have much more modified body forms. These you can see here are sea lice. Um, they actually, you can still see they have segmented bodies. They still have, you know, well-developed appendages on the underside, but they're already showing um, a lot of adaptations to a parasitic mode of life. And uh, sea lice are one of my favorite groups, particularly because they're this massive health hazard in commercial marine fish farming. And um, it's meant that over the years, I've been able to get grants to work on copepods by focusing on sea lice. I have the next slide, please. And the, this shows the number of species in each of these families along the bottom axis. Um, and it's basically just to show you that there are nearly 500 species of collegiate sea lice. Um, but they're by no means the only family. These are all families that are parasitic on fish. Um, and some of these in this figure are actually cyclopoids. So it's a mix of cyclopoids and siphonostomes. But just to show that there is, you know, a significant number of families that are parasitic on fish, and they are important. Now the next slide. Now this is where siphonostomes get their name from. Um, you can see on the left of the screen, that's the tubular siphon. Um, and the mandibles lie inside this siphon. Um, on the right, the mandible actually has been displaced. And you can see it's a very restricted, reduced stylet-like mandible with teeth at one end. Um, and it usually lies inside that oral cone. So that's the characteristics of siphonostomes. I, I have to show you the next slide because this is a very famous copepod and it's from the Santana formation in Brazil. So it's a parasite from the gills of a fossil fish from the lower Cretaceous. Um, and if you look at it, you can still see the maxilliped, the big clawed appendage. You can still see the mouth cone, which tapers to it. No, that up a bit, up, 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 yeah. Now, those are the antennae, that's the broken antennae. Um, the, that's the mouth cone. And then further posterior, you can see swimming legs, which are still segmented. And you can see they still have the CT on the legs. And it's 112 million years old. And it, it's preserved uncrushed in nodules, phosphatic nodules on the gills of the fish. So these are fantastic. You can go to the next slide, please. You can place them in a modern family. And one of the important things it demonstrates is that parasites, have, copepods have been parasitic for well over 100 million years. So it's an ancient group. And um, you know parasites have almost always evolved from free living ancestors. So it pushes back the origins of the crustacea way back into the Paleozoic, generally. OK, um, go to the next slide, please. Now, this is my deliberate mistake. It says five small orders, and I've listed six. <laughs> Sorry about that. And the first five are marine. So these are all relatively small orders. They are, um, some of them are unusual. Uh, and I've just briefly introduced them um, 
but I won't spend much time on them. So could we have the next slide, please? So the monstrilloids are a completely parasitic group. Um, this is an adult female. And if you look, it has between the antennules at the front and the swimming legs in the middle of the body, there are no appendages. There's a tiny vestige which of a, of a mouth cone perhaps, but um, they have no feeding appendages at all. No antennae, mandibles, maxillae, maxillipeds, nothing. Um, they are endoparasites as larval stages um, inside polychaetes or mollusk hosts. Uh, and then at copepodid five, they emerge to be free swimming in the plankton, marine plankton, where they mate um, and produce new eggs, which hatch into norpii, which infect a host again. So they have a very unusual life cycle. They're parasitic as larvae and free living, but non-feeding as adults. Could we go to the next slide, please? So this group, the Canueloida, was proposed in 2017 as an order. It was before that it was part of the Harpacticoids, and it was known as the Polyarthra. And it will revert to being called the Polyarthra very soon. Um, and it's a relatively small group, just two families, typical benthic copepods, all marine, I think, nearly all marine, um, and um, about 90 species. I have the next slide, please. The mesophreoids, this is one of my favorite groups. <laughs> I've worked a lot on these over the years. Um, there are three families, two of which occur only in um, anchiline caves. Uh, which are very specialized habitat, marine habitat. Um, and then one hyperbenthic family, the Mesophreidae. Um, and there, as, I, as it shows, there are 36 species in these three families. But they are particularly interesting in their biology and they have an extremely disjunct distribution pattern around the globe. Have the next one, please. This is the order Platycopioida. These are tiny, nearly all, of, they are all under one millimeter. There are only 11 species in four genera. Um, two of the genera live only in one anchiline cave on Bermuda. <laughs> Go figure. Um, and the other two genera are marine hyperbenthic, but uh, they are the first offshoot from the whole evolutionary tree of the Copepoda, and they retain more primitive characters than any of the other orders. So they're, although there are only 11 species and they're tiny, they're extremely interesting in terms of what they reveal about the evolutionary history of the group. Okay, next one, please. These are the more moniloids. Um, there are only four species. Um, two of them are up in the plankton and are encountered frequently and have been known since the 19th century. And the other two are benthic in deep water. Um, they are an interesting group, the non-feeding adult males. Um, and they have some characters that resemble calanoids which is why they're interesting from the um, evolutionary point of view. And then the sixth and final order, the Gallieloids. The next slide, please. And this is the freshwater order. Currently, there are only two described species from really deep groundwater. Basically, they live, one lives under the Pyrenees and one lives under the Alps. So underneath in really deep water, deep groundwater systems. Um, and uh, there is a third species that has been found in America and has been sequenced, but it hasn't been named yet, unfortunately. But we do know that there is a third species that exists. OK, so let's go back to the global diversity. Just to summarize that, that 78% um, 
of the species, so 11,500 approximately are marine and brackish water, and then just 3,280 are freshwater species. Okay. Next slide, please. That's just a reminder of which are the large marine orders, calanoids, cyclopoids, harpacticoids, and siphonostomes, and then we'll go to the freshwater. So only three large orders in freshwater, the calanoida, and at, at the moment there are 723 valid species, the cyclopoida, just over 1,200 valid species, and the harpacticoida at over 1,300 valid species. And then there is a small clade of siphonostomatoids, 47 species, and the gelyeloida, it's those two species we were just talking about. So now I think we'll look a bit at um, the trends in discovery of new species. So this is the discovery curve um, for marine calanoids. These are valid species. There are just currently over 2,000 valid marine species. Um, but this shows the accumulation curve, as it were. So next. So it starts with the discovery of Calanus vinmarchicus in 1770. Um, the next one was quite a gap, was Timora longicoris in 1785. But you can see after that, the, well, to just, just go back a bit. Just, yeah, after that, you know, into the late 19th century and then on through the 20th century, the numbers of species have climbed steadily. And there's some, you know, fluctuation in the slope of that curve, but basically um, it doesn't really show any signs of leveling off yet. So we're still in a, quite a strong discovery phase for marine calanoids. Have the next slide, please. Um, and this is looking at the number of new species described per decade. Um, you go to the next one. So you can see it's very erratic. Um, there's an obvious, uh, there are obvious peaks. The first one is, is Dana in the 1840s. That was the US exploring expedition. And he introduced a lot of modern taxa in that uh, report. The next is Brady, which was the Challenger expedition, the first of these global expeditions sampling in deep water. And then as you go on to the next, we have the impact of SARS, geo SARS and Wolfenden and the, the German South Pole expedition. So that was that first big peak. Um, then we have a gap essentially for the Second World War in the 1940s, it shows you the impact of such conflict. And then the numbers have been variable, but quite steady over um, the last 50 to 70 years. Um, with the impact of workers like Brodsky working in Russian waters and Far East Russian waters and so on, and Janet Bradford Grieve, Taisu Park, a lot of the people um, that uh, we've overlapped with. In fact, Gilmar and I have met some of these people at, um, at Cogapod conferences, although they're less active now, taking us through to the modern times. Um, go to the next slide. I was, body length is an important characteristic of all animals. It determines what well, impacts a lot of characteristics. And it's especially useful when you're exploring trophic pathways, I think. Um, and I was just curious, looking at that accumulation curve um, of new species, I was, curious about the body length. And I, I looked at the trend in body length of the newly described species. Um, and basically from the, the, the slope of that line, which is significant, um, it shows that the newly discovered species are getting smaller um, gradually, uh, which is logical. You find the big species first when you go out looking. The, the, the anomaly up there with the circle around it is 
Janet Bradford Grieve and I revised the Mega Kalanidae. Uh, these are really big copepods, and um, we recognized five new species. So that has distorted the, you know, produced an outlier for the figures in that one year. Five new huge calanoids. Um, have the next slide, please. And just to show you what a really big calanoid looks like, I know you've seen diaptimus, but they're usually all in the one, two, three millimeter category. So this is the largest free living calanoid that we had in the Natural History Museum collections, 15.8 millimeters. And just to put it in perspective, we have the next slide, please. That is on the same scale, that's Timora longicornis, which is extremely abundant, very important animal in um, European coastal waters. But just look how tiny it is by comparison. Um, but just in case you think calanoids rule the world, um, do you want to have a look at the next one? So that's the same calanoid next to a parasitic copepod, Spirium labigatum, which is found on a fish host. Um, so parasitic forms can attain much, much larger body sizes. I mean, of course, they are permanently attached to, or in this case, embedded in their food source. Um, and they process, they can process a lot of nutrition from the host um, into, uh, well, into reproductive effort, essentially. But uh, you can kind of see why I've, I've always been interested in parasitic copepods, and they are some of the most bizarre animals on the planet. Okay, could I have the next slide, please? So this is just a summary slide to show habitat usage by marine calanoids. So the vast majority, over 80%, are planktonic in the water column. Um, and then we have the next highest group is the hyperbenthic. So they, it's also called benthopelagic. Different people prefer different terms. This is the zone associated with the bottom. So maybe from the actual surface of the sediment up to maybe five or 10 meters off the bottom. It's where there's a distinct influence from the presence of the bottom. And it's an important habitat. It's difficult to sample in fresh, uh, in deep water. You can imagine you've got a net on the end of a cable that's 8,000 meters long, and you're trying to fish five meters to one meter off the bottom without crashing your net into the bottom. So it's been hard to get samples in deep water, but they're full of new animals. And then we have Anchiline caves that I've also mentioned and I'll briefly speak about later, and then estuarine um, forms. So by far the majority of these animals are found in the uh, planktonic water column. Have the next slide, please. Um, and you can see that th this is species richness. So you can find um, uh, nearly 500 species in the epipelagic, similar numbers in the mesopelagic. So epipelagic is surface to 200 meters, meso 200 to 500, and then bathy 500 to 1000. So these are all quite high diversity depth zones. In the abyssopelagic down to about 5,000, the um, diversity is significantly reduced. And halopelagic is basically in oceanic, deep oceanic trenches. Um, and the, diversity, the known diversity is very low, but of course there have been very few sampling opportunities and very few sampling expeditions. So there's a lot that isn't known um, for the very deep waters. Can I have the next slide, please? And just one final comment on body length. So this shows mean body length against depth for the top 1,000 meters, um, the blue figures are the daytime figures, which show that actually there's quite a significant increase in size um, from the surface down to 1,000 meters. And that's reduced at night because of that phenomenon of vertical diurnal migration. So a lot of the larger 
um, planktonic copepods migrate up into surface waters during the night because that's where the food is, that's where the primary productivity is, but that's also where the predators can see them during the daylight. So they migrate down again um, during the day. And that brings about this day-night change in body lengths. So when you're interested in these things, you have to take a lot of these other factors into consideration. Okay, have the next slide, please. So I just mentioned the Anchialine habitat. Um, there's a family called the Epacteriscidae, which is the, the first offshoot from the Calanoida. They're, it, it brings together all the most primitive characteristics of the calanoids, and almost all of them are found in these flooded marine caves or anchiline caves. Um, and I mention it because colonization of groundwater is something I'm going to look at, especially in freshwater, but it also happens in the marine environment. So this cave looks extremely open to the, to the, to the sea, but actually in most cases, the water is percolating through cracks and crevices in the rocks. So it's, it's not a, a free and open, open exchange of water. Um, what's interesting about them is that you get these extremely primitive forms that occur in these caves. Um, they tend to get larger the deeper you go into the cave, which is analogous to the deep water situation. Um, but I also, I've spent a lot of time working on these animals and I find them absolutely fascinating. They're an incredibly important group. Um, and they've gone from being unknown. The first one was found in 1973 to now it's quite a sizable family with maybe 40 species, multiple genera. Um, and again, as I say, right at the bottom of the calanoid evolutionary tree. Okay, let's have a look at some of the other marine orders now. I have the next slide, please. So this is the discovery curve for marine harpacticoids. So this is basically a proxy for um, benthic copepods. There are some benthic cyclopoids like the cyclopinidae, well, seven or eight small families of benthic cyclopoids but most benthic copepods are hypacticoids. And this shows again, the curve is continuing at more or less the same rate. So the discovery rate is fairly even. And again, it doesn't really show much signs of leveling off. And we know from work done in the Senkenberg in deep water, that the deep water hypacticoid fauna is amazingly species rich literally hundreds of new species, overwhelming numbers, in fact, for, for taxonomists to think about. Um, so they will be a long time before they get described and into the literature. I have the next slide, please. So this again, very similar shape curve. This is marine siphonostomatoida. So these are the all parasites. Again, very similar um, shape to the curve going evenly upwards. And finally, the marine cyclopoida, the next one. Now this, um, you can see from the, the bulk of the points on the graph <laughs> that the slope would have be, has taken a very sudden kick upwards. Um, and I think that's those two points that I've highlighted with red arrows. Um, and this represents a project that has kept me going during the pandemic. Well, I, I wasn't allowed into the museum for more than a year um, because I'm retired and I'm therefore not staff and they wouldn't allow anybody in except staff. So with Ilhoi Kim, we sat and described um, nearly 300 new species of cyclopoids, all of which are associated with tunicate hosts, you know, sea squirts, we call them. Um, and uh, they were collected by the tunicate experts in the Paris Museum um, who have retired, but they collected the copepods. They worked on tunicates 
but they collected the copepods they saw whenever they found them. So, and there were two of them. So they worked in the museum for 30 years each. So that represents 60 years of collecting, um, which is amazing. And it was a fantastic opportunity to be able to work on this material. Although I have to say, it's really boring describing so many new species. And if I hadn't been stuck at home during lockdown, I don't think we would ever have finished it. Anyway, let's move on to the next one, please. Next slide. So we just mentioned there the symbiotic copepods that were associated with tunicates. Um, and in fact, about 40% of marine copepods are symbiotic. Um, that's just a, a graph to show there are, there are a lot of families with a very long tail, but the, the most speciose family is still the Caligidae, um, and their numbers decline quite rapidly. But we'll go to the next slide, please. You find them um, on both fish hosts and invertebrate hosts. So um, all the ones on the left are from fish hosts, um, both elasmobranchs and uh, Actinopterygians, you know, Teleos fish. And on the right, um, we have parasites. That's from a crustacean, that's from a mollusk, that's, I don't know what that's from. <laughs> um, that's from a echiuran, that's on a mollusk, and so on. The bottom right is on a polychaete, the next one above it is on a cylindrate. So they use all sorts of um, hosts and the diversity of marine invertebrates in the host has been very in the oceans has been very poorly sampled for parasitic and symbiotic copepods. So there's a lot of diversity out there still to be explored. Um, one of the questions that has always intrigued me is how many times have copepods moved into parasitism? If you go back 70 years, all parasitic copepods were classified in a order called Copepoda parasitica, which was hopelessly um, polyphyletic. Um, a guy called Bob Cabata realized this and started to create what's basically the modern classification. But still the question of how many times copepods have become parasitic was always something I was interested in. I have the next slide, please. So there's a paper by Jimmy Bernot um, that's just come out this year that used the synthesis tree approach um, to look at the number of independent transitions into copepods, um, into parasitism. And he used about data on about 6,000 species that are uh, symbiotic um, within an analysis that involved all the copepods. So can you go to the next slide, which shows a bit more detail, that figure. Um, I don't know if you can see it very well, but uh, I have PDFs of all of these papers that I'm referring to or will refer to, which I will forward to Gilmar. So you will be able to, I mean, this is in Peer J anyway, so it's open access. Um, but uh, I will forward these reprints and you'll be able to see this better. But basically, um, any of those lineages that are colored in red are parasitic. Um, and this vast blue lineage on the top, the top, the top blue lineage is, are the calanoids, and there are no parasitic or symbiotic calanoids at all. Um, it just, it, it's not something that has happened in their evolutionary history. But can we go to the next slide, please? If you focus everywhere where there's red is the parasitic uh, groups. And these are all enumerated. And, and basically, um, there are some extremely large clades that are parasitic, such as the siphonostomes and monstriloids together, a big clade within the cyclopoids, which includes the old poicillostome groups. Um, and and then some scattered sort of excursions into parasitism in the um, 
in the half actic coida. But we found with this method, which combines all the evolutionary trees that there are available um, with uh, the Linnaean taxonomic hierarchy to try and resolve um, all parts of the tree. So it's, it's a way of estimating relationships and then mapping um, parasitism onto that. But it's an interesting technique. Um, and I'm, I was very pleased with this result because we have a minimum of 14 separate developments of um, parasitism in copepods. Okay, now I'm going to switch to fresh water. The fresh water fauna is diverse. It's less diverse than the marine, but I currently estimate about 3,280 species. And that includes planktonic, benthic, and groundwater forms, and a small number of parasitic forms, which use both freshwater vertebrate and invert invertebrate hosts. And copepods occur basically everywhere where there's water, from glacial meltwater to hot springs, lakes, caves, temporary pools, and phytotelmata. We have a look at the freshwater orders again. Oh, sorry. Down, 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 sorry. No, you go forwards. Yeah, not back. And again, and again. And no, sorry, wrong way. <laughs> Stop. Um, go to the next slide. Stop, that's it. Thank you. Sorry, Gilma. Um, so basically, we have these three large orders, but the interesting figures are the dominant family. So in calanoids, there are 723 species, but 625 of them belong to one family, the diaptomidae. Similarly, in the, cyclop in the cyclopoida of the 1,200 or so species, nearly 900 belong to the cyclopidae. And similarly, in the Harpacticoida, there are 1300 plus species, but 675 belong to one family, the Canthocamptidae. And there's a, another large family um, with over 200 species, uh, the Parastina carididae. So the diversity is more concentrated in fresh water. Um, the species riches. So fewer families have successfully colonized fresh water, but when they have colonized fresh water, they diversify very much more rapidly. So as another comparison with the marine, you know, the diatomidae with 625 species is by far the largest family in the whole of the Calanoida. So the largest marine families have fewer than 300 species. The same with the Cyclopidae. This is the largest family of all in the Copepoda. It's by far the largest family and it's freshwater. Um, and again with the Canthocamptidae, it is the largest family of Harpacticoids. That includes all the marine families. The largest is the Canthocamptidae. So it's as if when they colonize freshwater, um, they are able to radiate and speciate um, very successfully, uh, uh, but relatively few families are actually able to colonize fresh water. And this was something we'll return to in a minute because I, again, I found that colonization process very interesting. I have the next slide, please. So copepods can be found in all salinity regimes. And in fact, when you look in hypersaline inland continental waters, you find very specialized copepods in them from different groups, but they're always descended from freshwater ancestors. So they're not marine incursions. They are uh, freshwater taxa that have adapted to the hypersaline uh, waters. Um, when we were looking at how the diversity of of 
copepods in fresh water, one of the worst problems was trying to decide where the limits were to brackish water. I know these limits exist in dictionaries and in, you know, if you're a hydrologist, you could tell exactly where it is. But, you know, most collection data on copepods doesn't give accurate salinity information. Um, and in estuaries, of course, salinity varies routinely throughout the tidal cycle and so on. So that was always a tough decision, is trying to decide what the boundary was between freshwater copepods and brackish. And the other problem when you're looking at freshwater diversity is unscrambling the historical problem. You know, the, the, a lot of names of European species were misapplied um, to species collected around the world. And this led to a significant overestimation of the numbers of cosmopolitan species. Um, so, and that's a general problem. It was true of cladocerans, for example, as well. Uh, but it's gradually being picked apart now. I have the next slide, please. So just to switch back to morphological diversity, these are all freshwater taxa. At the top, we have a couple of calanoids. Um, then uh, that is a cyclopoid and then Harpacticoid either side of the female diaptonid. On the bottom, we have um, an ergocylid, another um, planktonic cyclopid, and then lernia, which is an embedded parasitic uh, copepod from the cyclopoida. Um, and that's a freshwater lernia podid, which is a siphonostone copepod. So you have the same range of morphologies from typical copepods to very bizarre animals that have few appendages, um, very reduced uh, body segmentation, uh, etc. So the morphological diversity is just as interesting in freshwater as it is in the marine. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So, as I said, I was interested um, in colonizations and uh, Damien Jaume and I just working with phylogenies in a kind of, I suppose, an early version of the synth synthesis tree method, but without any statistical support. Um, we uh, identified that there were at least 22 independent colonizations of freshwater by copepods. And we defined a colonization event as you know, getting into fresh water, but then speciating at least once. So we were trying to exclude, exclude, you know, singleton species that have managed to get into fresh water and stayed there, but have never speciated. We didn't want to count those lineages. Um, a number of other people have looked at this same problem. Can I have the next slide, please? I'm sorry, these figures are a bit difficult to see. But um, if you ask Gilmar, there is a PDF of this presentation, which I'm sure you could have a look at. Um, the, the number has gone up a little bit. It's now 23. Diana Galassi added another um, independent colonization. But you can see um, that these refer to a, just a small number. There are four calanoid taxa there. Um, the Galielidae, uh, maybe 10 um, harpacticoid taxa have colonized. And then we have some of the parasites. The Lernaeids are the fish parasites. Ergocylids are cyclopoids, but very diverse in freshwater. It's the one group that's um, really expanded in freshwater. And there is a, well, I'll come back to that. Um, so th this is an ongoing um, developing line of research, I, I would suggest. And the application of synthesis tree methods to this problem might well result in um, adding more or recognizing more colonization events. I have the next slide, please. So this is just to show that Lerniopodid family, um, the one branch, the early offshoot of this family, which is very diverse, 250 species or so in um, 
marine water, but there is a single clade of freshwater genera, seven genera, just under 50 species, um, all around the northern hemisphere in holarctic distribution. Um, so that is a, um, a freshwater clade of parasites. And I mentioned the uh, Gasylidae. Can I have the next one, please? So this is what the gill of a heavily infected fish looks like. On the right, you can see an SEM of a, of a, of a female just attached to a gill filament. Well, all the way on those fish gills, there are hundreds of these little females attached. And then you can see paired white egg sacs on some of them. So these cause a lot of damage in freshwater fisheries. Um, and they are a real potential problem. They have a very interesting life cycle. They um, are free living as nauplii and early copepodids, and they mate in the plankton and then adult females only um, find a host and use the host to provide nutrition to produce egg sacs and so on to reproduce. So they're a very interesting family and there's a huge clade in um, a huge lineage in the Neotropics um, with I think it's up to 18 endemic genera just in South America, most of them from Brazil. I have the next slide please. Um, there's one member of the Cyclopidae, really interesting. It's a proper eucyclops species, but in Lake Tanganyika, it's become parasitic on um, freshwater mollusks. You can see two which have uh, this blue pigment in their egg sacs and so on, attached in the mantle cavity of this freshwater mollusk host. So, you know, there's interesting, there's interesting, um, lots of interesting animals in freshwater. Okay, the very last topic I wanted to look at really was colonization of groundwater. It's a really important trend. Can I go on to the next slide, please? Um, about a third of all Cyclopidae are stygobionts, and numerous copepod groups have independently colonized groundwater. Um, our, knowledge, our knowledge is very patchy. Have the next slide, please. This is just from a paper by Diana Galassi, just to show you, these are all different kinds of harpacticoids and cyclopoids, but also with two um, calanoids and a galleloid. These are all groundwater inhabiting freshwater copepods from a wide array of different families. So there's a significant diversity, but as I say, it's not very well studied. So could we go to the next slide? Now this shows numbers of species of freshwater copepods from surface water versus groundwater. And for each of the localities, there is, um, we have these comparative data. So just to pick out a few, if you look at the total numbers for France, there are more groundwater copepods. Look at the totals right at the bottom. Of that, yeah, there are more species of groundwater copepods than there are surface water. And if you look at Italy, just next to it, it's a very diverse fauna, but nearly half the species are, are found in groundwater only, they're true stygobionts. And then if you look at North America or Mexico, not much work has been done at all. The, I don't think these figures are real. I think these are a sampling artifact. So I think looking in groundwater will be an extremely rich source of new freshwater taxa. Okay, so could I go to the next slide? This is kind of a summar summary slide, really. I mean, copepods are extremely adaptable. You find them in all sorts of salinity regimes, um, all sorts of temperature regimes, all sorts of depth zones from the surface to the bottom in the oceans and in the deepest lake in the world. They're parasitic on all kinds of hosts and they've repeatedly colonized freshwater and repeatedly colonized groundwater. And often when you colonize groundwater, you get more changes in morphology associated with miniaturization and oligomerization. And that was really my summary, but I just had a a kind of postscript comment on molecular data. You know, 
So yeah, go to that. I mean, 15 years ago, taxonomy was based on morphology, but now we routinely incorporate molecular data, but we're not there yet. Can I, sh next slide. So this shows, again, back to marine colonies, uh, marine calanoids. This is species richness. On the far left, the two most diverse families, the Aetidaeidae and Scolesitrichidae, um, uh, those are the two most diverse families. And families like the Calanidae and the Timoridae are much lower in diversity. But if we look at the availability of sequence data in GenBank, have the next slide, please. It's, reser it's reversed. The Calanoid, the Calanids and the Timoridae have by far more sequence data. Go to the next. And these very diverse families have not been sampled much at all, A to date. So next. Um, and the, you know, these are significantly different. So go to the final slide. That was just a point to make that we are increasing the availability of molecular data. We did have a slow start compared to some other groups. So with decapods, they are much, much further ahead in making molecular data available. But molecular tools are incredibly important and we need to get on with this job now to integrate molecular data with morphological data. And as those slides showed, the last few, there's a historic sampling bias. People have been sampling particular families more um, because of the questions they were interested in, I suppose. But we have the opportunity to overcome that now as it's become relatively cheap to get sequences um, and certainly much faster than it used to be. And with that, I think I should stop. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Jeff. It's a brilliant lecture. So many formations, uh, very important. Uh, so can I can I make some questions, Jeff, from, from the yeah. public? Yeah. yeah, of course. Okay, just uh, stop the share. Here, uh, Camila, do you have the questions? Uh, a question from Haley Soares. Uh, are their size linked to predation scrap strategy from the pods? Uh, is, is the size linked to, I didn't, could you say it again? Uh, if, uh, are their size of the copper pods linked to predation scape strategy uh, about the size, probably is a strategy or not? That's, that's interesting because certainly in open water environments, um, copepods that are in the water column are very exposed to predation, especially visual predation. So I think it is an important driver of behavior. Um, I'm not so sure it's a driver of size because um, there are conflicting data. So in the marine environment, most planktonic calanoids are broadcast spawners. So they release their eggs into the water column. Whereas the dominant calanoids in freshwater, the diatomids retain their egg clusters while until they are ready to hatch. That makes them a bigger target for a visual predator. And it would seem that the evolutionary balance must be very finely balanced, if you know what I mean. Um, so I think it's a really interesting question. And there, there are some people that have looked at this. I'll, I'll try and find some references on that. It's, I, um, because I don't think there is a simple answer, I'm afraid. Next question. Uh, a question from Eneida Maria Esquinazia Santana from Brazil. 
uh, what would be the reason for the high species diversity in marine and freshwater Arctic wider? Um, I think it's to do with complexity of the habitat. You know, the if you are benthic, um, then that's essentially a three-dimensional habitat with all sorts of micro habitats inside it. So you can you can burrow through the sediment. You can be interstitial, which means you live in the spaces between the sediment grains. And those are two different behaviors. You can be epibenthic. You can live on the surface and you can live on or associated with anything that's growing on the surface. So you you find a lot of phytal harpacticoids. So they grow in the hold fast of algae. They they will inhabit the sponges. You know that they will grow on and in and or live on and in um, anything that is on the floor of the of the lake or on the floor of the ocean. So I think it's I think it's to do with micro habitat complexity um, because it's so different from the open water, open water column. Thank you. Uh, a question from Fabio Amodio Lozac Doha uh, from Brazil also. What can explain the success of copepods being found in different types of freshwater and marine environments and in different habitats? Um, I think, it's, again, these are all really interesting questions. I have to think to answer it. I think time is an important dimension. I think um, to have for a lineage or an evolutionary line to have time to adapt and diversify and go through adaptive radiation, you need kind of geological time scales. And I think copepods are a very ancient group. And one of the factors that is interesting that is making me think like that is um, in freshwater lakes, it's the ancient lakes like Lake Baikal. You know, it has nearly 150 species of copepods. It has parasitic copepods. It has cycle Clopidae that have evolved to live in sponges and and I think it's because the lake is so old uh, you know it's more than 25 million years old um, and I think there's been the stability for uh, and the opportunity over geological time periods for copepods to adapt um, having said that there are some groups of copepods that are very plastic, um, uri, what's the word? They're kind of uri haline. So some of the timorids um, can pass from fully marine water into fully fresh water just within, you know, with, within a migration. So they can survive in both. So um, the potential for that kind of behavior is there within the group also. So I'm not sure if that really answers the question, but you could write books on these questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jeff, cyclopod is not recent compared with the other orders. Cyclopod? I saw in this Silden, Silden 20 time, in nature, I think. In nature communications. Yes, yeah, but I disagree with that. I, you, you put me in contact with some colleagues of yours who had some of that um, bitumen preserved yes, yes. material. Now, I still, I've still got all the drawings I did of, of that material. I, I don't believe they're copepods, and actually, I don't know if I believe they're crustacean at all. Um, 
we should have a discussion about this, but the, the, I think there's a real problem with interpreting those fossils. And they've been very selective in the fossils they chose. Um, and you, the material you sent me, which I did drawings of, and I, I have no idea what happened to that paper, um, I think demonstrates the problems with that Selden paper. So I don't believe they're, you know, I mean, maybe all these groups of copepods go back to the Cambrian. I don't see why not. Um, but they just, you know, they're small, they're not calcified, they don't fossilize very well. Um, you know. It's a nice discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, question from John Vitor, uh, the male assist. What are the main opportunities and challenges in studies of benthic copepods? What's the main opportunities and challenges? Um, I think in somewhere like Brazil, um, one of the challenges will be the, the diversity and the, the proportion of um, new species. So there's a lot of taxonomy to do. Um, although, you know, molecular methods can provide a lot of shortcuts. Um, it, it can make the primary sorting of samples a lot easier. I think the opportunities are immense. I think the, the groundwater benthic um, and benthic freshwater animals have not been particularly well explored. Um, I think once you get below about 100 meters in the ocean, you know, the vast numbers of new species. Um, so in a sense, that's an opportunity. I think another opportunity is figuring out where they are involved in the trophic chain, as it were, um, in the food chain. Because I remember seeing some work on baby salmon that take in, a, take in water and spit it out onto the surface of the sediment and stir up the surface of the sediment. And then they pick off copepods that are suspended in the water by them. And I just thought, you know, that's, uh, no one really had suggested they were going to provide food for for small fish like that. Um, so I think there's a real lot of interesting biology to come out of it as well. Thank you. Uh, more questions, Camila? Uh, a question from Reynaldo Luis Bozelli, also from Brazil. How difficult is the integration between morpho morphological and molecular data? Um, it's getting easier. Um, you know, ideally, if you're going to work on the molecular biology, or the, or, what am I going to say? Both of those approaches are tools. They're tools, and it depends on the question you're answering. So if you want to look at phylogeny, if the question you're interested in is, phylogenetic relationships, then you have to have a kind of dominant molecular angle these days. You know, I am I taking too long with these answers? Because I remember when I first went to the Natural History Museum, my boss was testifying as an expert witness in a murder trial because a body had been found in the estuary of the River Thames and the forensics people had found amphipods trapped in the clothing and they wanted to know if the amphipods were freshwater or marine or estuarine and whether that helped with the trial and he'd written the book on british amphipods so he went along and testified and that was perfectly acceptable in 1975 but now it would be completely hopeless, you know. It's, the lawyers would say, you mean it's your opinion based on morphology? What about molecular facts, you know? So um, it, it's not difficult to integrate data. Um, 
you ha it depends on the question you want to use, you want to address. Um, but I think it's incredibly important to do so. Um, so if there are difficulties, you know, find collaborators or learn the techniques yourself. Um, and you just have to do it. It's you can't not have that if you want to go into biology now. The tools are so powerful. Uh, Jeff, nowadays uh, people are using uh, specific genes or the genomics? Um, with copepods, they are expanding the number of genes they use. So traditionally, they used to use 18S, maybe 28S, um, CO1. But Jimmy Bernot, who's paper I referred to, um, Jimmy was trying to use seven different markers to look at um, copepod ordered orders. Um, and that is the way it will travel, I think. I, genomics is a long way off. And actually, from what I know of the genomics, it's very confusing. There's so much noise surrounding the signal <laughs> that it's difficult to distinguish between signal and noise even with the kind of statistical methods they have and the incredible volumes of data they have um, so maybe new tools will come up for handling these genomes but at the moment i think the route the way to go is to to find more informative markers and to move from two or three markers to maybe 10 or 12. I think that's what's happening. Thank you. Our questions? Uh, question from Maria Estela Maioli Castinal, also from Brazil. Does the diversity of freshwater copepods in the tropics follow the same general diversity pattern in terms of number of species and size of organisms? Um, in terms of number of species, uh, yeah, I, I think you have, certainly in freshwater, you have increasing diversity um, as you move towards the tropics from temperate zones. Um, I think it, some places have been poorly sampled. So that is less apparent, but my gut feeling is that that is quite a strong pattern. In terms of size, I, I don't know, uh, to be honest. Um, the, the body length data, uh, I, haven't, I haven't looked at and I haven't seen anybody else look at it. So I actually don't know. Um, you wouldn't want to use groundwater animal uh, taxa to test that idea because they are all miniaturize as they colonize groundwater so i think that would obscure any signal but for for diatomids or something that might be a really nice nice project to look at actually because you have really good diversity in the neotropics um a lot of endemic genera of diatomidae in the neotropics um, and also high species richness in Africa as well. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm afraid I, uh, the second part of that question, I, I, I don't think anybody has really looked and I haven't seen the data amassed anywhere that I could even hazard a guess, I'm afraid. More questions? Uh, another question from Rafael. What can you say about the status and tendency of invasive species in UK and Europe? Apart from the parasites, there is any example of existing disruption caused by invasive copepods? Again, another really interesting question. Um... For, for example, on fishes, on fishes or on 
other species? I don't know. Well, um, Raphael was saying, you know, other than parasites. So, um, I mean, we we certainly have examples of invasive species, but um, so what am I trying to think of? Pseudo Pseudodiaptimus marinus um, is a Southeast Asian species, estuarine species, so not really freshwater, um, estuarine and marine. And that is now, um, in the last 10 years, that's become common all around the Mediterranean in lagoons, and it's become common even in the North Sea. Um, but I don't think it's led to any documented ecosystem disruption. I mean, I guess the potential is always there, but you know, the marine system is in a state of flux anyway. Um, because of global warming, the North Sea is becoming much more diverse. So the cold water fauna is retreating northwards and it's being replaced by a more diverse warm water fauna. Um, but these warm water species are all much smaller. They're much worse for fish larvae to feed on because they don't contain as much nutrition. Um, so in a sense, that have, is having an, uh, an environmental impact. Um, it's reducing the growth rate of, of fishes um, that ultimately, you know, uh, we catch, people, humans catch. Um, but I, for, in terms of copepods, I don't, I don't know of an example I can think of in fresh water that isn't parasitic. Thank you. Uh, more one question or from uh, an old student to yours, ah, Jeff. <laughs> Nelson. <laughs> from Aguinaldo. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, could you please point out what you think are today the gaps in the copepods knowledge? Congratulations for the talk. <laughs> Thanks, Nelson. Um, well, um, the gaps in knowledge you know, it's the same as I would have said 30 years ago, we still don't have a robust phylogeny that is um, of, at the ordinal level. You know, the, there's the hint of one out there, but the paper that it was based on, Kodami et al. in 2017, has been retracted and there's no substitute for it. So I think we still need a phylogeny. Um, I think there's still uh, an opportunity for a lot more work on developmental biology. So um, I looked across all the calanoids to see how much data were available, how many data were available on developmental stages, life cycles. Um, and it's, you know, it's in the order of one or two percent of species. Um, and, and actually, you know, when you take plankton samples, often 70% of the individuals are developmental stages. Uh, if you're dealing with low diversity habitats, that's not too much of a problem. But if you're dealing with high diversity ha habitats, it, it restricts the amount of information you can you can get out of your samples in a way. So I think that is an important thing. Um, basically, trophic work, you know, uh, I guess in fresh water, you know, if you're dealing with diaptomids that I know both Gilmar and Nelson, you love diaptomids, you know, they're up in the water column and fish are going to feed on them. <laughs> um, but there's a lot we don't know about the place in the trophic system for a lot of these other copepods, the harpacticoids, the cyclopoids, you know, they're present in large numbers and they're going to be important in the ecology of these habitats. Um, but we just have a few systems that have been worked and most of those are in Europe or North America in temperate zones. And we need, we need more work coming from the tropics because the systems are different in the tropics. 
Thank you. Uh, more questions. Uh, question from Amil, Amilcar Farias. Thinking about marine invertebrates associated copepods, we find a high number living inside them. But artrogidae are always found in low, low numbers. Are they not really living inside these hosts? Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, you only ever seem to find artrogids in ones and twos. And that's true in European waters where the species are quite well known. Um, you never find them in any great abundance. I, I suspect they spend a lot of time away from the host. So maybe their biology is more like a tick, you know, that they will attach to the host to feed and then drop off and then attach the host again to to feed and then drop off and lay eggs or, or whatever it is. Um, certainly, we know that is the that's the kind of behavior of Argulus. Now, Argulus is a related group. It's a branchiuran. It's not a copepod, but that's the biology of branchiura. They attach to the fish. They have a a good feed and then they drop off and lay eggs on submerged hard surfaces and then they have to find a host again now it always felt counterintuitive because in a big ocean with these small animals surely the hardest job is to find a host and if you drop off you have to do it again and again and again but we know there are animals that have that biology, so it must work and there must be ways of getting over the host location problem. So that would be my guess is that we're not sampling, you know, the population is mostly dispersed and um, they, you, they use the host very much in a temporary way. That would be my guess anyway. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I think uh, we finished the questions. And if you allow me just a final question, are you still supervising students or not? <laughs> <laughs> you stop it. <laughs> well, you know, I retired in 2017. Yes. So um, amazingly, because of COVID, I still have my office because there was pressure for me to give my office to the next person. But now nobody goes to work anymore. Everybody works from home. So, so but no, I'm not really taking students. I mean, uh, for short visits, I can arrange that, but um, uh, not for extended visits like both you and Nelson were able to have. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, there are uh, many people uh, giving congratulations for you and it's a very nice talk, very nice lecture. I'm, I'm yeah. seeing them at the bottom of the screen. Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you for listening and making the time to listen. It's, it's, yes, it's, it's really very really important. Uh, Jeff, uh, so we we finished here. Thank you again. It's a brilliant talk from you and your knowledge is, is amazing. Thank you thank again. You, thank you, Juma. I will send you a folder with the PDFs so that people can have them if they ask you for them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I will pass to our students. Thank you, Jeff. It's a, it's a pleasure to see Bye you. From England. Bye, -bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye.